Ready? Here we go. I didn't bring Good to see you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh Lord, you are the light. You shall be found on those who are in darkness. And they were illumined. 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 And they were Walk in the way of your gospel teachings, and glorify the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Saints Mary, pray for us. the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. All right, so we're back on our introduction of the book. I must be getting tired of learning. So I grew a whole group of people like, oh, I totally forgot last week. Yeah, that's the way it usually works. Now once you get into the rhythm, then we stop again. And since we are creatures of habit, that means we kind of bump along. All right. Now, if you go into the introduction page of Father Salim's book, where we left off last week when we were talking, um, he gives some three main points that we have here in bold. And this is the way we'll do the book. I'm just pulling out parts of it. So you should be reading ahead. So he points out three of the main characteristics. A lot of these we actually already covered last year in detail when we went over the maps of Aramea and everything. So you'll notice that the Maronites are both influenced by the Western Syriac and the Eastern Syriac churches. The Eastern Syriac churches today are the Church of the East, or it's known as the Church of Assyria, or in the Catholic form, Chaldeans. And so if you were to go to their liturgy, it's a form of Aramaic, Syriac, um, but it wouldn't look exactly like what we do. And the same thing if you went to a Syriac Orthodox Church or the Syrian Catholic Church, it wouldn't look exactly like ours either because we pull from both traditions. So that's number one. That it is the Maronite tradition is pulled from the Western Syriac expression. Remember, all of this area is now what is modern day Syria, Lebanon, Eastern Turkey, and the country of Iraq. That's what we're talking about. So the Western Syriac expression come out of the great city of Antioch. And there are two things to note here in the characteristics of this Western tradition. One being the great emphasis upon the humanity of our Lord. The great emphasis upon our Lord as being the promised one, the Messiah, the rabbi who comes to teach us. And so the great emphasis upon our Lord's human nature. Obviously there's no denial of his, his divine nature, but it's a great emphasis and a great humanity. And I mentioned to you last week, it's actually one of the things that I found most attractive about the Western Syriac tradition, this great emphasis on our Lord. When you go into a Byzantine church, when you go into a Melchite church, you have the great cupola above you with Christ Pantocrator above, creator of all, powerful. And it's very majestic and it's very impressive. Because in the Byzantine tradition, the emphasis is upon our Lord's divinity. Right? That great emphasis. And in part because the Arianism was the separation and, a and, and making our Lord only being a human being. A great human being, but only a human being. So out of fear that there's, a, there's kind of a, a, great ex a, a great emphasis upon our Lord's divinity. But the Syriac tradition never did that. And I gave you the example being, 
is the emphasis in the Kadishat. In the Kadishat, the Trisagion is focused on our Lord. It's not a Trinitarian prayer, even though it's in threes. And normally when you have things in threes in the liturgy, it's emphasizing the personhood of God. But in this case, the Kadishat is focused upon our Lord. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is the literal interpretation, the historical approach, literal interpretation of Scripture. And this is one of the things in the 300s that leads to a great amount of conflict, actually, amongst the regional churches, because the Antiochians are very much emphatic upon, you read the text that's there, the Scriptures. You don't, the Alexandrians, the Egyptians, were all off doing allegories. Our Lord enters on Palm Sunday, there is a cult, there's an ass, and the cult, the foal, and the two, because the two represent, and then they go off onto some kind of, you know, these are, these are the people of the Gentiles, and the people of Israel who are being carrying in the Messiah, which doesn't in the text, and the Antiochians would always be like driven nuts by this, and the Alexandrians were always doing an allegories to give spiritualized teachings from the text. So, as far as the Antiochian church was concerned, you're just using the, the, the written word of God as a springboard for whatever kind of imagery you want to yank out of it. And so there was always a big clash between them. It's going to lead up to part of the great fights that are going to take place in 431 and 451 over <clears throat> how do you read the scriptures. And so, the great emphasis is upon Whenever you are in the Antiochian tradition, the historical approach is, who is the author? Can we locate it in time when it is written? What is the genre, literary? What is the literary form? It's a very modern approach that they use to scripture, but this has always been a tradition, but specifically within the Antiochians, in contrast to the Church of Alexandria, so the Copts. So it's... It's, um, that's the fundamental history. Of course, over the centuries, they meld and they, they borrow from one another in the interpretations. But the fundamental idea is um, this historical approach. And it's not surprising for a church that emphasizes our Lord's concrete humanity as the incarnation of the divinity. Yes? I know this is modern, but could you contrast what you just said with the difference between how we as Catholics view the Bible versus how some of the um, Protestants view it as the Word of God in the seventh, you know, it, because that's, a, that's also a contrast, well, the, yeah, but it's well, a different Peter's contrast than yours, right? Well, the Protestants, the Protestants would normally be literal. But the literal, problem, right. But the problem with How is that different from the Antioch? Yeah. Because you remember, all the Catholics and all of the Orthodox traditions always read Scripture within the tradition. The con right, the context of the tradition. And the, and the Protestants, as their very definition, use the scriptures to judge everything else. Right. Okay, so that's Which is why traditions disappear, and so what happens is, is one of the great pitfalls, and you can see it reading any kind of Protestant literature, is they'll pick certain texts, and those become their central texts forever, and they ignore everything else. And so, we ignore everything else. It just becomes, it's, it's only read in conjunction with those key texts. Yeah, I just wanted to understand the difference between literal yeah, and So that, in the okay. Catholic tradition, we always have what's called the analogy of the faith. Okay. And so the analogy of the faith, analogia in Greek means a, um, a fraction, a proportion. And so when we, when we, as Catholics, what we talk about is everything that we read, everything that we study, everything that we learn, there's an analogy of the faith, which means that, for example, if we're going to talk about the stainless conception of the mother of God, it's always going to be read in conjunction with everything else that we believe in the gospel and in our tradition. We're not just going to take one part of it, and then in taking one part, so well, I don't actually believe that, for example. And then, because everything is interlinked in, in Christianity, everything's interlinked. You take out one part because you say it's not important. And there are Catholics doing this these days, going, well, that's secondary, it doesn't matter. But Pope Pius XI, at the beginning of the 20th century, because people are already starting to do that at the beginning of the 20th century, so let's ignore specific things that are too Catholic, and that way we'll all kind of get together and love each other more. And Pius XI said, but it's all part of the same revelation. The creation of the mother of God of this woman is no less important 
than the fact that Jesus Christ is God and man. You can't say, oh, well, let's drop some of this Marian stuff, and therefore the Lutherans won't be so upset with us. All we've succeeded in doing is making Catholics into Lutherans. Because we said, well, these are secondary, we didn't emphasize them, we didn't teach them. And in not teaching them, well, if you don't teach them, nobody knows them anymore. I mean, just look at your grandchildren. So that, that, but that was happening at the beginning of the 20th century, okay? So the, uh, that's the, probably the biggest way that you read things differently. Yeah, that helps. Thanks. If you read, for example, if you read a Catholic commentary on scriptures, say a classic commentary, you will, have, you will have the scriptures and you'll have references in the scriptures, but you'll have a lot of footnotes that will refer you to past papal teachings, councils, Commentaries of fathers. I mean, in some ways it's summed up in the Hayek Bible that I gave you. I mean, the whole thing is mostly notes. But you're being linked with council teachings, you're being linked with the fathers, you're being linked with catechism, references. Whereas if you read a Protestant book on the scriptures, it almost inevitably is scripture only referring to other texts in scripture. Because there is no analogy of the faith because they exclude tradition. But of course, in the Catholic mind, we always understand primarily our faith is tradition. And in that tradition, we are told that these books are inspired. You cannot know that the books are inspired except by someone telling you that. Reading lists of genealogies in the Old Testament, no one's, I mean, a lot of people say, well, I feel that it's inspired. Well, feeling doesn't have anything to do with it. And reading the list of, gen of, of genealogies and family listings I don't know about you, it doesn't move me at all. Yet it's still as inspired as the Gospel of St. John. Okay? But we only know that because we have what our heritage of what has been given to us within the church, which is this tradition. Right? So that's the first point. The second point is, he mentions then the church of Nisibis, the church of the further east, if you want, the church of Mesopotamia. And remember, Mesopotamia was never in any permanent way part of the Roman world. And so it always has something a little bit more exotic to it. You know? you, at best, you kind of divided between the Tigris and the Euphrates and Persia and Rome for centuries as they moved back and forth. And when we left off in the springtime, or in the fall, we talked about why St. Ephraim is, is in Edessa. That's not where he started. He started in Nisibis which is even further east than Edessa. Okay. They're, both, they're both still located in what is now eastern Turkey, southeastern Turkey. But <clears throat> Nisibis, Nisibis was never really, in any real way, permanently as part of the Roman Empire. And that's why when the Persians took it back after a momentary hold by Rome, part of the military treaty was you allow the Christians to leave if they want, and they went west. And that's when they go to Edessa, which is part of the Roman Empire. And that's why the last ten years of St. Ephraim's life are spent in Edessa. But most of his teaching, his poetry, and everything is actually in Nisibis. All right, so we have the Nisabine Church of the East. That's the second point. And there, it's the great emphasis upon the poetic style. And there, because of Afrahat, the Persian sage, Saint Ephraim. These individuals are the ones who give us the poetry that we've had in our tradition. And we should relish that poetry. In some of the reforms that they're doing in the last, last decades, there's been an attempt to kind of like prune down a little bit of the imagery. So instead of doing two or three verses on something, saying, well, we already said it in the first verse. We don't have to keep saying the same. But of course, that's what poetry is, right? You keep going back to it. Psalm 117 is the classic. It just kind of keeps going on. Of my meditation upon the law of God, the word of God. The, it's just about the beauty of the law of Mount Sinai. And it goes on forever. It's the longest psalm. In fact, in the traditional Latin office, the divine office, the public office of the church, of the Western church, saying the Latin office, that psalm was so big, it was sufficient to be the office of mourning, mid-morning, 
noon and the mid-afternoon. It was exactly one psalm just broken up into pieces because it was so long. But if you read it, you go, this is redundant. And all, this always struck me because the professor I had of exegesis for scripture when I was in Europe, he was a Hebraist, you know, Greek, and he knew all these texts. And, and some of, you know, the Roman Catholic seminarians were a little like, this is boring, and it's just redundant over and over again. How, you know, your word is a light to my path, and I meditate on your word, and I meditate on your commandments. Your directives keep me on the right way. And, and it goes on for this huge psalm. And I remember once he just kind of he'd lose it in the sense of throwing things, but he, he became quite upset. And he explains to them that about the psalm, this is the poetry of the person who understands that God has spoken to, to the people of Israel on Mount Sinai, and how I as an individual find my life and salvation within that communication. He says, this is not redundant, this is beautiful. And that is precisely, if you read the poetry of St. Ephraim, there is a lot of back and forth, certain key images that are used, but it's that poetry, that poetry which is present. And it's important to understand is this is poetry not because they are unaware of the Greeks and the Latins doing rhetoric and doing syllogisms and doing philosophical approach to expressing the mystery of salvation. They are very much aware of that, but they don't care to use it. Because for them, the divine mystery is always ineffable. It's always inexpressible. And so the best way to even come close to trying to articulate or express it in some way is always around it in imagery. And so it's, so it's not the fact that they just don't have it. They follow very much the biblical tradition of the prophets. A lot of the great prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, these are, these are poems. These are poems. And when we know the Aramaic text, when you know the Hebrew text, you see a lot of times it's almost in puns. Remember that the Jesuit scholar, Father Carmignac, in the 1980s was writing a whole, it was his whole thesis that not only was the Gospel of St. Matthew, which by tradition we've always been told that its original version was Hebrew, Aramaic. We don't have that text, we only have it in Greek. But his opinion was that all three, Luke and Mark, were also originally written in Hebrew. Not Aramaic, in Hebrew. He was a Hebraist. I, mentioned, I think I may have mentioned to you, or at least to some of you, is that what he did in the beginning is that he took the Gospel of St. Luke, and these canticles, like for the birth of John the Baptist. And just for fun, he decided, well, what would this look like in Hebrew? And so he starts translating the Gospel of St. Luke into Hebrew from the Greek. And he realizes there, there are, for example, in that canticle of the birth of John the Baptist in Hebrew, with the name of Zachariah, Zachariah uh, Elizabeth, there are, there are puns, there are, there, are, there are plays on words in this canticle when it's in Hebrew of the names of Elizabeth and Zachary and John within the canticle. So he, he did this expose on that. So it, the poetry behind it is part of the tradition that's being continued in this eastern part, if you want, of Aramea. And again, not because it's not, it's just the choice that they made. And then thirdly, the deep and abiding influence of monasticism. And we forget that. I think we've lost a lot of that in the last you know, half century for sure. And now, thanks be to God, we have a few men who have actually climbed back up into the old hermitages in, in the mountains of Lebanon. But for decades, we had nobody as hermits living anymore, which is kind of a shock and a scandal. You know, of course, one of these men famously is, is from Colombia. He, he was a Roman Catholic, became Maronite, and was given to occupy one of the old hermitages in the mountains, you know, quite famously. I think there are three men now who are actually in the mountains established as hermits. But that monasticism, we're going to come back to in the second half, but I'm going to give you the patriarch's uh, <coughs> epistolic letter from last Lent. By the time they translated it from Arabic, they basically sent it to me just before Easter. I thought, well, why am I going to put this out, this Lenten letter for Easter? And you'll see why, because it's all in the fasting tradition. 
So we had one of the ladies come up to me on last weekend, and she's like, oh, no, you know, when we were in Lebanon, we were eating fish and things you know, during Lent. I said, no, I know. I said, and she said, I saw the bulletin. And I went, yeah, I did. did you see the Maronite voice? She said, yeah, I saw it there too. She came back the next week, and she said, oh, in the meantime, she's like, oh, this is really fascinating. She wasn't saying, no, we didn't do this. You know, she comes back, and she comes back the next week, and she's like, oh, I talked to family back in Lebanon, and it's everywhere that the idea of, no, not even fish, you become vegan. And I said, well, that's the patriarch from last year, so it's caused this big emphasis. Yes? I don't want to get you off the hook, but we had told Father Larry something that he had never heard before. We were, most of us were taught that if you give up something for Lent, you can have it on Sunday. No. He had never heard that, and, and, and it that's, was pretty And that's common. the Latins doing it. You'll see in the Patriarch's letter, he doesn't talk about anything along those had lines. Had you heard that anywhere else? I just know that that's what people do now. No, I've always tried to bash my head against the wall in every parish I've been in to try to restore a notion that the great fast means something. <laughs> you know? It's, it's said, working. Well, I gave, up <laughs> I gave up chocolate, and I only eat it on Sundays, and it's like... But Sunday is not a mini Easter every day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's, as I mentioned to one of the people that I was talking to last week, I said, it's the reason why in the Byzantine tradition you decorate these eggs so beautifully. Because you haven't eaten any eggs for the two months, seven weeks. And so, of course, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it in a second now. Anyway, so the third part in is this great influence of monasticism. So, on one hand, we talk about the asceticism. And that's one qualification of monasticism. The fact that we, we fast, we follow. Remember, when we go back to the history, and we're going to go back for a moment, is that the reason why this tradition this becomes a church is the lay people gathered around the, the, the ascetics. And it's clear that the ascetics are going to influence. How goes your priest goes the parish. It's inevitable. You know, so, so if you're walking <laughs> around a monastic setting where the priests and the sisters are living this ascetic life, the people are going to start adopting the way that they live. The other problem we also have in the modern world is we eat way too much food anyway. So we eat such a rich diet in the first place that, you know, giving up, you know, the fifth meal or the snacks in the middle of the afternoon is like a huge sacrifice especially as Americans, because we're so used to grazing. We just kind of eat throughout the whole day, which, as I mentioned to you, is actually one of the five forms of gluttony. You know, it's just eating out of time, just the idea of always munching on something. It's actually a form of gluttony. So, but because we do that, when it comes time to say, all right, one meal, we're like, ah, oh, shoot me now, I'm going to die. This, I'm never going to survive this. <laughs> because we're not even close to even just three meals, you know, or two meals. We just kind of... Like I said, munch all day long. And so we've already lost, because we're so undisciplined, even what used to be considered a normal form of discipline, then, you know, this is really hard. And it's hard until we, it's hard until we rechange the way we think. Right? But the beginning part of the letter, you will see, it's the question of repentance. All right. So that's one thing, is the asceticism is the monastic. The other aspect is the, the divine office. You know, in Maronite parishes, the people would show up again on Sunday evening, because you're still not working on Sunday. You, you know, you'd have your meal and your family together in the afternoon, and then you would go back to the parish church at sundown, and you'd do round show for Monday for the beginning of the week. You'd show up for the office, and you sang the office with the parish priest. This is why this is so much part. If you go to the Byzantine churches, Melkite to it, They'll sing orthos. They sing the morning office before the liturgy on Sunday morning. It's very long. That's good. It's very really, long. Really but that's what sun, but that's what Sunday's for. So that's yes, theirs is very long. And the pressure is on them to also streamline because once you read critical mass, they're gonna make everybody do this. Because you know, the Maronite liturgy used to be longer too. You know, I've even I mentioned to Bishop Gregory, I said, you know, would you have any opposition at some point in the future that when our people are thinking in this kind of monastic and office way that Saturday afternoon at 4 would begin actually with rum show of Sunday and then we'd have the mass immediately after, basically at 4, 4.30. He looked at me surprised because apparently I don't think anybody ever asked that question. And he said, well, no. I mean, no. That would be our tradition to do something. Well, 
When I was in Idaho, I used Roman Catholics in the 1990s who had never heard the word Vespers. By the time I left there, at the end of four years, there were a hundred people coming to sing. Nothing else was going on. You didn't get anything. There were no palms. There were no ashes. You didn't go to communion. You didn't get nothing. <laughs> but a hundred of them would show up to sing the divine office in Latin. So I know it's possible. In my youth, we were here every Sunday night. There you go. Uh, every Sunday night. What were you doing? Were you doing a benediction? What were you we doing? We did a benediction. benediction. FIFA, when did that stop? When we got lazy. FIFA was saying, you know, she, you know, she remembers the Wednesday and Friday's fast at home when she was a child. It hasn't been that long. That's why I'm trying to remind us of these things. And clearly the patriarch is also. We had extra activities on Sunday. People do other things. Night mass. Yeah. And then, yes, once you uh, introduce Saturday night mass, Sunday kind of quasi went down the tubes. It just went down. Because at that point, it just wasn't. You know, Sunday was you figure out how you're going to get the Mass on Sunday. Well, the easier we made things from the 1930s onward, the less we even bothered doing. All right? And that, but that's human nature. You know, October, May, October, <coughs> every night for the, the rosary. Service. The rosary. Every yeah. night. Rosary and benediction. Because October, October was the devotions for Our Lady of the Rosary. So every, yeah. every night you'd have exposition of the Blessed Sacrament, say the rosary before it, finish it with benediction. Yeah. Every night in October. Yes. And yes. May, and I think March it was St. Joseph. I don't know. I can't yes, remember. I would like to see someday that we actually have a public novena before the Feast of St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. I don't know that you ever, you must have done that before. Anyway, so... <coughs> And then the third, so that's the divine office, the public <coughs> praises of the church. Because, you know, you can pray the office, but it's when it's done within the church that it's in its normal form. And having the clergy as part of it, who are deputed to preside over that office, it's not even any longer just a private devotion that you may read at home already. But now, this is actually the public praise of the church, of the parish, doing what Maronites have done from the beginning which is to raise the praises of God. That's why it's so sad that so many of our Maronites just want to get in and get out. And the idea of getting in and expeditiously get in and out, give me my communion and let me go. The idea of coming to the church to just raise divine praises for half an hour, and that's, it's, it's tragic because it's, it's not only not part of the Catholic tradition in general, it is absolutely not at all part of the monastic tradition of, that's why, you know, the ancestors gathered around these places, because in this convent, in this monastery, they're singing the office. You bundle up your little kids and you go trundling down the dirt path back to the church in the evening. You spent the whole afternoon together on Sunday. What's another hour? You've already spent four hours just with family and visiting and eating, and that's wonderful, and resting. Now it's time to, to welcome the beginning of a new week with the sun going down on Sunday and you're back there for the office. That's another example when we say monastic. Sometimes when we just say it's a monastic church, people just think about asceticism. Right? But it's those three factors, really, when we talk about it, that is in this. Okay? So those are the three things to note from this part of this introduction. Now, we also talk about the Catholic faith Eastern style. And I want to give you an axiom. It's in Latin because it's from the West. Where are the girls? Anne is not feeling good, oh. and I haven't heard from Judith. So. They always ask, since I started writing this out, I was thinking they always ask good questions. And so. Yeah. Supicandi. 
this is, I mean, it's a quotation taken out of Prosper of Aquitaine. So in the 400s, Prosper was born. He's contemporary with St. Mary. Okay? Prosper of Aquitaine is a layman. This is probably one of the most famous phrases in the church. And what it refers to, and this is also, I mean, Prosper of Aquitaine, because Aquitaine is what's part of now modern day France. And he's a disciple of Augustine in North Africa, and he finishes his days probably as a secretary for Pope Leo the Great in Rome. So, you know, the movement around. And he's a layman. But what he does in one of his writings, this is the writing on, he's writing on the, the Roman bishops. He's writing on the pontiffs. And what this, what this refers to, legem credendi lexta tuat. Am I missing a T, sorry. Stop tuat. Stop tuat. Could you spell that, please? S T A. T-U-A-T. It means to establish. Statuat is third person singular subjunctive case. May it establish. So it literally means the law, the manner of praying, may it establish the manner of the law of believing. So with any generation, Repeat that again. So literally, it's saying the law, the manner of praying, it establishes the law or the manner of belief. So this goes back to what we said in the beginning, that in the Catholic tradition, we read within the analogy of the faith. We receive something. Here is the way we pray. Here is the way the divine liturgy. We have never seen ever in the history of the church done to any liturgies what we've done to liturgies in the last 50 years. Never happened. Because the idea what you received was a sacred heritage from your ancestors, people you don't know. That's what they prayed and that's what they received. And they received it from people before them. And they received it ultimately from the apostles. For a generation to come up and go, yeah, we can do a better job than this. This is, this is, you know, this is redundant. This is long. This is repetitive. Nobody ever thought that way in the church. Because, and when it came time to say, well, what do we actually believe? Because we're just living this reality. Well, we look to our tradition. This is why in so Nestorianism, and we've got to touch on this history a little bit. That's why when Nestorius starts saying, because he's a very scholarly man, and as Archbishop of Constantinople, you know, he has a number of sermons talking about, well, you refer to Mary of Nazareth as being the mother of God. And that's very pious, but it's not accurate. And he starts explaining in his way of interpretation that Mary is not really the Theotokos, not really mother of God. Well, the place explodes. And the people react against that because my grandparents taught me calling her mother of God. And so you, bishop, bishop that you are, you're in this line also, and you're as much as obliged to the law of tradition as anybody else here. No bishop, priest, pope can change the heritage we've received. So the people go up in arms. They even, they stop going to the liturgy. They write a letter to the emperor in Constantinople, and they say to him, and they ask, please intervene and get this heretic out of our midst. Get rid of the bishop. And because they say, write in a letter, and they say, an emperor we have, but a bishop we have none. And why are they rejecting it? Because of their faith. They know that what they have been taught in praying is they address Mary of Nazareth as the one who brings forth God. And their sense, even if they can't articulate, they know that ultimately if you're telling me that Mary at Christmas time is not the mother of God, then what's the baby in the crib? Is it not God? That's the real fight. These are not the questions of like, well, that's for your pious term. This is why among so many Protestant traditions or churches or whatever you want to call them, 
They'll, mother of Christ, mother of our Lord, mother of our Savior, but mother of God. Hmm. Hmm. That's a Catholic thing with the rosary. But the argument is not about Mary. The argument is about what's the baby. And so because our prayers have always been talking about her as the one who brings forth God, Lex Suplicandi, what's been given to us, our heritage. Always remember the term in our, one of our liturgical books is called the Fenquito, that treasury, that jewelry box of what has been given to us by the previous generations. Right? So we are, we are part of this lineage, and we are meant to give untarnished, unbroken, that tradition to our children. And as I've mentioned numerous times, we've done a terrible job in the second half of the 20th century. All right? And even when it is passed on, a lot of it's kind of mutilated. It becomes, you know, something else. And so Prosper of Aquitaine, he's born about 390, and he dies about 455. And so he's a contemporary, slightly younger, but he's a contemporary of St. Mary. But it gives you a magnificent vision of <clears throat> not only Catholic, the Catholic tradition, but again, he's West. So it's not like the West only approach it as cerebral, though that becomes more and more the, the kind of Western approach to the faith is dissected and you know, give beautiful expositions of it, but it's less about living it, which is why, by the way, we reached the 1960s, the Romans were quite happy by their intellectualism to rework the entire divine lineage, which is shocking. Because what they did, in a sense, is they flipped this around that the law of believing, your catechism, is such the way you're going to pray. And so they said, fine, let's do a new liturgy then. And it's quite shocking what they wound up doing, but it's totally outside the line of the last 20 centuries of history. So, so the prayer drives the belief rather than the belief driving the prayer? I know that's sort of simplistic, no. but... In this quotation? No, that quotation yeah, is the prayer is the driving the belief. The heritage, the way we pray, the way right. we have the divine mysteries. Defines you know, the, the, the source right. of our knowledge of our doctrines is in all of these prayers and right. what we do. Exactly. Okay. I mean, we have the fathers and all that too, but it's primarily how does the person, you know, standing in the middle of the church of the parish, how do they know what the faith is? It's in the liturgy. I think I told you the story when I was in Greece. I was talking to one of the Greek Orthodox priests. This was in the late 90s, and I asked him, I said, how is this great resurgence going on in Russia? You know, when you know that for 70 years the government tried to kill religion, made a lot of churches into museums of atheism, and a lot of the priests and bishops were members of the KGB, you know, and others that were informants. How does that work? And he said to me, he said, they didn't change the liturgy. If the Soviet Union had insisted on changing religion, then you may not have had that renaissance. They don't really care what the sermon is talking about. You learn from the prayers that go on for two and a half hours. That's what you're learning. And then you do it again next year. And every 12 months, it's the same prayers. And you just absorb this. So, you know, that handful of babushkas, all those old ladies who kept going there for 70 years, kept the reality going, and now the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren of those women are the ones who are surging back to the church. Much to the confusion of their boomer parents who were raised in the atheism of the Soviet Union. They're like, why, why do you want this? You know? So now you have in Russia 75% of, of the population claims to be Russian Orthodox baptized. But when the wall came down in the 1980s, 20%. That is an enormous change going on. Yeah. We never talk about that. But there's an enormous thing going on in Russia right now. But it was an actually a very astute response by this priest to say, but during those years, they never touched the liturgy. They never changed it. And when you think about what your parish church looked like in 1952, compared to what it looked like in 1992, if we touched anything, it was the liturgy. We changed sanctuaries, we changed music, we threw everything out, we liquidated, we did all of these things, and where are the kids? They're not storming back to, to <coughs> baptism like the Russians are, yes. Is that in, uh, in any way connected with uh, 
the uh, Belladad and the uh, in, in the infiltration of the Roman Church with communists and things like that. Um, we don't really. We have to. You have to make connections in historical conditions to say that you're doing what. You know, it's the question whether or not one of the great architects of the Latin liturgy, Bonini, whether he was a Mason or not. Right. Those are historical questions. I don't. You know, I don't know them in detail. But there's always a possibility because you know that by changing the way people are going to believe. So the the synopsis form of this is Lex Orandi. Lex credendi. That's hard to see, Abuna. In red? Yeah. Lex orandi. Lex credendi. So the law of of the manner of praying, orandi, establishes Lex. So the reason why I brought it up, even though this is a Western saying, um, you know, in the early centuries, the connection and communication was much more intimate within the empire of all the different churches. And so the mindset, it's like if you go look at any of the basilical mosaics in Rome that predate the, the 11th century, they look like icons. I mean, they're icons. The Western change that takes place is after really the big divisions that take place at the time of the Crusades. And so this vision of the concreteness of the lived faith, that is Eastern. It has always remained the Eastern tradition, yes. This Prosper of Aquitaine. Yes. Did he have several other writings? Uh, Other than this, he had lots of yeah. writings that were absorbed within the like church. Also, well, what do you mean by absorbed by the church? Well, I mean in the within the He's traditions. He's within the tradition. He, yeah, and he's certainly one of the major teachers, major writers in the fifth century. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's part of the repertoire. And he's the one of the great exposers and great defenders of the doctrine of Saint Augustine. Saint Augustine dies in four thirty. Prosper dies probably about the mid 450s, so he's probably just like a generation or something younger so than Saint Augustine. There are his writings out there. Oh yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can find them. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a in the 19th century there was a man called Migne, M-I-G-N-E, and Migne collected all of the Greek as much as many manuscripts as he could find of the Greek and the Latin fathers, and he did this vast multi-volume library. In the, in the end, of the collection of patrology. So it's known as Ming's Patrology, and you have all the Latin fathers in Latin and all the Greek fathers in Greek, and it is a huge collection out of the scholarship of the 19th century. A Prosper of Aquitaine is certainly among those. But you can find his works independently also. I'm sure they're on the web now. And so, but this is under the section here about this fact of the Catholic faith Eastern style is this fact that for us first and foremost it is you'll notice that what he does on the second the next page page there's no page number the second page there are page there's no page numbers on it X X so oh, X I've written on top of it I guess yeah it's up in the yeah it's up in the left oh yeah I have a parenthesis of of uh, Lex Orandi Statua Legion Credendi is covering it over. <laughs> but he gives in Western Catholicism, by the 11th century, you have that fidens querens intellectum, faith seeking understanding. That's the famous axiom of St. Anselm. St. Anselm is the 11th century um, Archbishop of Canterbury. And it really is the beginning of what we now call scholasticism. Remember, scholastic just means the schoolman, scholar. And so that is very much of the Western tradition. That's how can we articulate this deeper and deeper and deeper. And of course, it's going to come into full flowering and glory with the Summa of St. Thomas in the 1200s, 200 years later. It moves away from this 
in the sense that the primary thing is let's try to figure these things out and express them. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, St. Anselm is one of the doctors of the church. But it's a different approach from the East. The East is standing in front of the iconostasis. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, ba 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 Incense and incense and incense. And here, take the little kids around to each of the icons, because that's the way they learn. Who is this model? And then you explain. They learn through the icons. They learn through the doing, right? And so that is very much part of it. So the emphasis is based upon the liturgy and the direct experience in the East. It's embodied in this, he has it in that second paragraph. It's embodied and celebrated in liturgical setting. So whenever you have an Easterner who goes, too long, don't make me do something extra. That is not an Eastern attitude. It may be a Latin, expedite this, get us in and get us out. But the, Latin, but the Easterners have always, even if they find it long, and they may come late, an hour late. I mentioned to you when I was in Ethiopia, the Ethiop the ceremonies on Sunday begin at 5 a.m. Primarily the older people and the monks and that, people who are up at 4 o'clock anyway, so they go over to the church at 5. What's the problem? And then they start, and the ceremonies are going to finish at noon. And people will come in and out, you know, depending on what they're coming for and when they want to come for communion. You know, and I went into this cathedral in Addis Ababa. I mean, this church is absolutely jammed full of people and children were everywhere. The women are all on one side and the men are all on the other side. And they're all wrapped up in their white veils because when they come to church, they all cover themselves in white. The men have a big white shawl around them covering their body. The women have a big white shawl covering their body on over their head. In the apostolic practice that in prayer and prophecy, the women cover their heads. And so they're still practicing these in many places. So the Ethiopians are an example. You know, I d doubtless there are very, very few people who are there from 5 until 12. But the church was so full, there are people outside the building, standing against the wall in the stained glass windows, like the wailing wall, and praying against the wall while the masses, the liturgy is going on inside. It's a beautiful thing to see when you see like God means something in their lives. Right? Well, the, the overflow is such, and so it's pretty impressive. So, but it's a lived reality. So like I said, not everybody's coming there for the entire thing, and that's all right. And coming, you know, and the Mass is going on and on and on and on. These priests are reciting hours of prayer at the altar. But again, they're all facing east, so you're standing there for most of the time, you know, you're all facing the same direction. The priest is facing the same direction, you're facing the same direction, so you'll see the back of all the clergy through the doorway and the altar, and you're all facing the east praying, and it goes on four hours. In fact, you have prayer sticks in Ethiopian tradition. Really, what they are is crutch, so you can lean on it the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> because pews are a modern, a, modern, a modern influence, and basically from Protestantism, because Protestantism was you go sing hymns and listen to a two-hour lecture on the scriptures. So you sit for that because you're at a lecture. But in the liturgies of the church, the universal church, hey, you're wandering around. <laughs> That's why the Latin tradition in the Mass up until the 60s, bells were being rung, because it's like, hey, look over here again. All right, get away from those icons and stop lighting all those candles. It's time for the consecration part. So the bells ring on all the essential parts. <laughs> Monsignor Root in Fall River still has them ring bells during the consecration while he's singing the Aramaic. You remember this, don't you? I, when I was in Italy, uh, it was the first time I'd ever been told to be quiet in the, in the basilica. Oh, really? You know, yeah. The priest stopped everything and just yelled out, Silencio in, in the basilica, por favor. Oh, because people were talking. There were hundreds of tourists. Though. Well, that's the other problem. Is we've also lost the sense of the awe before the divine majesty. Mm -hmm. We talk in churches like it's the grocery store. Yeah. And that is actually really offensive to the tradition of our faith. People do that at St. Patrick's because it's a tourist place. Everybody wants yes. to see St. Patrick's yes. Cathedral. Yes. So the priest will be up there conducting liturgy, and there are hundreds of tourists. But when the Mass is on the main altar, they 
They try to push, do it. They start pushing people out. It's hard. Of people course do it's it hard. in St. Joseph's, too. Pardon me? People do it in the back of St. Joseph's, too. <laughs> yes, they do. All right, so we just, I just want to, the first part of this, I just want to lead you up to that section. We're going to come back next week at the beginning to look at the Eastern view of Fides Adoran's Mysterium, but we'll come back to that next week. I just wanted to give you the, the initial parts of this, and then, so take a little break. Uh, is there coffee or something? Yes, I made coffee. Okay, so this There coffee. is decaf and regular in the kitchen. Okay, so take a little salad platter of the Patriarch. Thank you. Do you want it? I want my shoulders. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I've got it. You've got it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to get this in at the beginning of Lent, um, and you get the nice copies, nice and stapled in the booklet form. The ones we'll put by the door will just be corner stapled photocopies. But I want to go. We're not going to again. We're not going to read this. As you can do that, but I want to point out, so, I mean, you'll be reading it as I talk to the Thank you very much. Is that yours? Yep. All right. So, as I said, last year I received this, like at the end of Lent, and so I kept it, because also I knew it was pretty dramatic. <laughs> because you don't usually find any of the bishops or anybody talking about, well, let's go back to doing penance. And so, as soon as I read it last year, oh, you get one? Yeah. So, um, but again, it took a while for them to translate it from the Arabic. Now, one of the first things I want to point out here is we have in our opening prayer during the Masses, during the weekdays, the end of the prayer is rather unusual. I need to ask, I need to ask um, the bishop or some of the liturgists about this, because at the end of our prayer, it says, you know, so that we may be prepared to arrive at Easter in your resurrection. But in English, Easter and resurrection, they're the same holiday. So you see in the first line on this when the patriarch opens up, when he says that the time of the great Lent is a spiritual journey in which we prepare to pass over. And I actually think that what they're translating at Easter is the Pesach. Now, we've talked about this before. In Hebrew, Pesach is the word for Passover, which literally means passing over, the movement over, right? It's the, it's the movement of the angel of death over the people of Israel, past the doors that are anointed with the blood. It's also the passing over of the people from the bondage of Egypt into um, to the mountain of Mount Sinai. And of course, our Lord's Passover is his passage from the death in this world into his resurrection. And our transformation is a passage from this worldliness that we often live in to the spiritual life, the Christian life, the life of the gospel, a Passover. So Pesach, and I think what's happened, and I know, I'm almost sure that that's how it's translated. Because in the book of the office that we have, in the, uh, the Shehim Tov, we have, the prayer comes up again, but the Shehim Tov that we're using is translated from the French, which is translated from the Syriac. <laughs> and in French, the word is Pach. So, Pesach, in the Hebrew, was transferred over, so you still have the QE for the K sound, and then you drop the S, and so it becomes PAQ. P A Q U E S. And the only distinction is, say, well, well, and it's the word for Easter, resurrection. See, our word Easter is a Germanic word referring to the goddess of fertility of springtime, Erster. All right? So it has nothing to do with any of the Christian tradition or Jewish or anything. We just have this Germanic pagan name for the spring festival, Erster, right? Which basically means East, which is why Austria's name in German is Österreich. It's the Eastern Kingdom, Österreich. So Erster is the goddess of fertility. 
I, I find it, that's why this morning, you probably didn't notice, this morning I said, so that we may be prepared to come to your Passover and your resurrection. Because I think it's what it's supposed to say anyway. But we don't have the Syriac in the book, so you can't even actually find out what the original prayer was. You have to find the other text. And that, I don't read Arabic. That's huge, that, that those two meetings... I mean, no wonder people are so confused. So this is, but this is a little tiny detail on a word. Yeah. In French, of course, in French, this is plural, l'époque. And it has two meanings, whether it is grammatically masculine or grammatically feminine. Okay? Because, you know, in French you have masculine and feminine. They drop the neuter. In Latin, you have feminine, neuter, and uh, masculine. They drop the most of the whatever was in Latin, neuter became masculine in French usually. No. So, anyways, l'époque in the masculine form refers to the Old Testament Passover. Okay. So what we would call Passover is Lepak masculine. But Lepak feminine means the resurrection, Easter. Oh. This is very confusing. Yeah, it is confusing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Where, did the, the, where did this... That's Jewish. just what they did in French. So, you know, if you go, if you go to a Melkai church, they refer to Easter as being Pascha. Because the Greeks took Pesach and made it Pascha. The Paschal season, right. Pascha. Now, I would prefer us to call it Pascha than to call it Easter. This, the, this Germanic fertility goddess just drives me nuts, the name. Um, I, I never understood why in the Western, in the, in the, in the English speaking Germanic world, we never got rid of any of the pagan deities. You know, Monday is still the day of the moon, too. It, all of the gods are still there on these different days. Of, you know, including the sun. It just is weird. In the Catholic countries, like in Italy, Italy just numbers the days. You know, you have, you have Dominica, you know, in Spanish and those different languages. The Dies Dominica, the day of the Lord. So, in French it's Dimanche, but it comes from Dies Dominica. And then you have day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. And then you have Sabato. You have the Sabbath, Shabbat, for Saturday. So there's only two days of the week that have names, Sabato in Italian, and Dominica. So you have two days, and the rest of them are just numbered, which is the way it is in Latin. Mm. So we kept these. So in its feminine version, it refers to the resurrection. So how long have they used Easter? Like 500 years? Or oh, much longer than longer that. Longer than that. I, I just think it never, it never got changed. It just was, you know. You know, instead of, you know, worshipping the bunnies and the eggs, you just kind of said, well, they're part of, you know, the Christian text. <clears throat> so, this is why the greeting in, in French is joyeuse Pâques, in feminine. If you were to say joyeux Pâques, you're a Jew. <laughs> because it's, it's, you're using the masculine form. It's a small thing. But it was like bingo, as soon as the patriarch begins by saying, we prepare to enter into this Passover of our, of our conversion. Anyways, it's a small detail. So, you know, if we come across it again about Easter in any of the Sunday liturgies, don't freak out if you hear Passover instead of Easter. Yes. Because then it means we prepare for this Passover, your Passover, our Passover, and your resurrection. Otherwise, it's say we prepare for your Easter we prepare for Easter and your resurrection in English is the same thing. Yes. Well, the term Passover is actually a Jewish terminology, correct? Right. Pesach. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, Pesach. That's, Hebrew. that's Jewish. And Jewish terminology. And they use the term Passover to mean that whatever it is that they use it to mean. So our Lord's so death at the Passover. So the Christians, all of the Christian, all the Catholic nations... In the Catholic tradition, it's moving Yeah, so it in out. Italian, for example, it's become Pasqua. Like I said, the Melkites, the Byzantine tradition, in Greek, they'll call it Pascha. Pascha becomes Pak. you see. But for some reason in the Germanic countries, we kept these old Germanic gods and goddesses as terminologies for our seasons. 
It's one of the reasons why it's another question I have to ask them. We keep saying the entrance into the great Lent. Lent is a Saxon word that means spring. It doesn't mean fast, it means spring. Lent is spring. So I'm sure the original terminology is the great fast. But it's one of those questions I have to ask. And it is in English, you know, so. All right. So, that's one thing to note here. And I would say the first two lines give you the whole theme. We prepare to pass over with the Passover, capital P, of Christ to a new life. All right? Through repentance of heart and its fruits. All right. So what are the fruits? What are we doing here? All right. So, when we talk about penance, the whole letter is about penance. And penitence. And of course, when we use the word penance, in its Latin origin, and even in English, obviously the word penance and pain are related. But that's not the Greek terminology in the Gospels. Right? So I would say for the fruits that we're looking for, there are three. <clears throat> The first thing you want to note is, what does the word fruit mean? And we forget this. Well, some of you just don't know it. The word in Latin, frui, no, because it's Latin. The word frui in Latin means to enjoy. Fruor as a Latin word, means I enjoy, fruor. Frui is to enjoy. It's a deponent verb. And so the word fructum is the past participle of frui, meaning that which is enjoyed. Right? So when we talk about fruits, that is the thing which is giving us source of joy. It will link automatically, in a very easy way, in St. Paul's letters then, to the fruits of the Holy Spirit. You know, the presence of the Holy Spirit, which brings this joy. Not exhilaration, happy, 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 but the joy of the contentedness of the possession of good. Okay? And not money and right. property. Right. So the fruit, <laughs> so the word to enjoy, the word fruit, literally the word fruit, by way of French, just means that thing which has been enjoyed. Okay? That's what fruit means. Fructum. That participle in Latin is fructum. So this word, fructum, is that thing which has been enjoyed. It's actually the past participle of the verb. All right, so, um, so just on the word fruit, the first thing to note is fruit is the result of flourishing. And the word flourish is blossoming, to flower, right? Fruit is the result of flourishing. So obviously I'm adding to what's in the letter to give it a fuller, to give it a fuller explanation. So that's the first thing to note about fruit. It's a result of something else even before, which is good health in the plant. If your tree is dying in the backyard, you're not going to have cherries this year. And so that's the first thing, is that fruit is the result of flourishing. You are only going to have the fruits of repentance if you are healthy in the life of grace. In other words, as an application. The second thing to notice on this is that the fruits are manifestation of the interior life. What's going on within this person? That's the parable, you know. You, you want to vomit after the 75th time someone quotes to you, judge not unless you be judged. It's like, okay, that's one line out of the Gospels. What about, by the fruits you shall know them. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. By their fruits you will know them. Our Lord's telling us, judge. Okay? It's important, that, that's why it's important to always keep the scriptures in their context, you know. Because doubtless it's some, you know, lunatic who just is going, knows that quotation from the scriptures. 
Judge not, lest you be judged. Okay, fine, that's one thing else. You know anything else from the gospel? What else can you pair it out? Do you even know what that means? What is the context that he's even talking about there? Because clearly the exact same man tells you, judge the tree by its fruits. And he says, the tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So there's a lot of meanings for judge in our modern language. And it's, some people use it sort of discriminatory judge. In the but our Lord says, you, boy, what they do externally, you judge them as being a good or bad tree. Right. Judge less, is saying, well, whatever she's doing, she's an axe murderer. Well, you can't judge her heart. Don't we're saying yeah. it. Look, what she's doing is evil. <laughs> if that were the case, right. you wouldn't have civil courts. You right. wouldn't you have, have, to, you wouldn't have, have prisons. Right. You, have you just go, visit. well, yeah, the kids are kind of like spread all over the basement in the backyard. But <laughs> she really, you know, but she was suffering post-traumatic stress and postpartum depression. So you don't, you can't judge her heart. So you have to let her go. Nobody does that yet. Getting there, though. We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> yeah, but it's fake news. Well, we're getting there. So the, second, so the second point is, is that fruit is telling you this tree is healthy. Yeah. Right. So fruit is a manifestation of the inner life. So the third point to note about fruit is, fruit, what does fruit contain? Seeds. Seeds. And seeds are what? The propagation of new life. Why does fruit come up? It's not just simply to be enjoyed by somebody. It is meant to bring forth a whole new generation of life. The fruits in the Christian life are meant to bring others to salvation. They're not just about me. And that's one of the hardest things for Americans to do is to understand that the Christian life is about the body of Christ. It's not about me personally. That's a Protestant idea that starts out with the principle with Luther that everyone is personally inspired by the Spirit of God to know the Scriptures. Once you've done that, and then you say there is no visible church, once you've done all that, well, it's inevitable at some point the individuals are all going to create their own form of Christianity or their own religion, which is where we've arrived at. It's the, you could know this, and actually it was denounced that, that even in the 1500s. Because you look at the principles and you know what the conclusions are going to be. But the important point, because we live, and I've talked about the fact that because we live in a Protestant country, we do not have the understanding of the, of the liturgical life, the mysteries that are central to our existence. So that we look at church too commonly as being just kind of like Protestants, but just with more stuff. Which is, it's essentially different, completely. And so the same thing here in the spiritual life, the Christian life, we think about it about as Jesus as my personal Savior saving me, dying for my personal sins. And those things are true. But John the Baptist didn't look at the disciples around him and say, look, he died for you, and he died for you, and he died for you, and he died for you. He said, no, look, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's the world that is being redeemed. And you're all invited to be saved within it if you want. That's the vision of salvation. Now, he's come to redeem humanity, and the individuals can be incorporated into it if they so choose. They're so you invited. need to accept the invitation and then yeah. take the steps. And then, right. and then collaborate with that, that life and that gift. Right. So that's why the third point about fruit that we often forget about is that it's not about me. <clears throat> I mean, it's about me. But it's, also, it's ultimately meant to bring new life. It's meant to propagate seeds of new life. All right, so. Now, the patriarch goes on and he talks about that to produce good fruit is evidence of your repentance. And he quotes Matthew chapter 3. And then he gives four. He says these, these fruits are four. And he talks about walking the light of the truth. That's the act of faith. All right? The act of faith. <coughs> faith, you know, when we are baptized, faith is infused, you know, in the case of a baby, faith is infused in the baby at the time of the baptism. For adults, oftentimes, they already have the grace of faith even before they're baptized. But in the case of the faith, the mystery being worked, the faith is given to this child and hope and charity in the state of grace. And what you now have is you have seven years to teach this child how to collaborate with the work of God. 
And then you reach the age of reason. That's why we talk about the age of reason. When you start discerning things, this is right, that's wrong. When you're three, you don't do it because you don't want your hand slapped. Right. But when you're six, you know, well, that, well, that was bad. Even if mommy's not in the room. That's why when you walk... So the difference in the thinking is we call the age of reason is because we begin to discern things as being good or bad in themselves and not whether I get my hand slapped. Okay? Or get a cookie. So you have about seven or eight years as parents, which is a pretty good period of time, in order to get this child so that when this child consciously, individually arrives at his first conscious moral choice, it's already become trained into him as second nature. And then he collaborates and begins to flourish. The, and that child then begins to start collaborating personally with that grace, still holding the hand of his parents, you know, and being helped along, but now it's becoming his work personally. That's why communion is, is given at the age of reason. All right? It's the idea that this is the next movement into this participation. All right? So that's the important thing. And that's why those first 10 years are so vitally important. So it's the question of active faith. So the four-year-old, no, a four-year-old doesn't understand the Holy Trinity and all this Jesus stuff. They actually understand much more than we give them credit for. Yes? The Maronites confirm at baptism. Yeah. We also used to give communion until 1929. Okay. Why, why do we do that? but all the other churches confirm, like, I don't know, 12, In fact, 13. everybody did. Even the Latin church used to do that. And in fact, the churches in Spain continued, even beyond Rome, starting to make confirmation at a different time. Even though the Spanish priests continued well into the Middle Ages giving, giving a chrismation. Because there was, they didn't have CCD here, so I had to go to CCD at St. John's. And... Back then, we didn't make our confirmation when we were baptized. At least I wasn't. I was right, baptized here right, right. and not confirmed here. Right. So I did it at St. John's. And the whole thing was, I remember the buzzwords, it was making us a soldier of Christ. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's a perfection. It's a perfecting of what is given to us initially through baptism. So they stopped it's because it? The, it's because the Eastern Rites have never de developed a baby baptism form. The Latins developed a ceremony which is that you have a, in the Latin church, traditionally, you have a rite of baptism for adults and a rite of baptism for babies. Okay, now my Xavier has been baptized and confirmed here. When did they start doing confirmation with baptism back in the Maronite church? That's much more recent, in the last decades. I don't know exactly the year, but it's the last decade. So, well, and they're hoping, <coughs> and so they were, they were probably both stopped in 1929. And then confirmation came back, and so a number of the priests are hoping that the Eucharist will also come back, like it was up until 1929. So, so this is the first point, because the other one is prayers, fasting, and alms. All right? So the, the fruits here, because we don't often think of an act of faith as being one of the fruits of, in a sense, conversion. And that's why, you know, we can have people who are baptized, and they're baptized. They carry the sacred character of Christ, the divine word, word incarnate, metaphysically impressed on them, sphragis, the seal. And yet it's dead because they have no active faith. They don't have faith. They don't believe. They have been metaphysically transformed, but they are personally not engaged with faith. Okay? That's a distinction that the church has always had. So we aren't going to say they're not a Catholic, but they are actually a dead branch. So when our Lord says, you are the, you are, I am the vine and you are the branches, and the branches that do not bear fruit will be cut off and thrown into the fire, and even the branches that bear fruit will be per pruned so that they will bear more fruit. The mystery of the cross. Right? So it's, 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 a, it's an important thing. So that's the first fruit the patriarch brings up, to walk in the light of truth. Walking, in, for St. Paul in the letters, means living. Walk in the way of the Spirit. Okay? Number two is prayer. We're meant to develop and deepen our prayer life. And fasting, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And alms, what almsgiving is. It's a real misunderstanding of what almsgiving is also. All right. 
So the first thing is he talks about what's the origin of all these things is the virtue of penance. Right? So the patriarch that we have, Bishara Butros, Cardinal Rai, is first of all the first monk, the first religious under vows to be patriarch since the 17th century. Wow. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's the first thing. And the second thing is to know that he, he's been a teacher professionally. That's what he's been doing. He's always been in school. And he's always a teacher. And that comes out very clearly in this letter. I mean, really clearly. The last letter was also good, but it's not like this. So, so he mentions that it's a, penance is a virtue and a sacrament. It's two different things. And he mentions here, as a virtue, it's based upon a return to God. Right. So there are four things to note in this little paragraph. One is conversion. Penance is about conversion. Conversion is a word that we don't like anymore, which is bizarre, because it's a very classic word from the beginning of turning toward the Lord. You know, so when someone becomes a Catholic, we almost never use the word conversion. We'll say, well, they're reconciled to the Catholic Church if they were Protestants. Or if they're baptized, baptized we'll talk about them as being catechumens, which is a very <coughs> classic word also. But talking about conversion, I don't know if that's supposed to sound negative, because you're turning away from your previous life or something, so that must mean you're making a judgment about your previous life. But that's exactly what it is. You are changing. You are changing. You are turning towards the Lord. Then that's the very first part of this penance, is conversion. The second, the second thing to note here is the contrition. Contrition, which is another word which is kind of disappearing from our vocabulary. So, <coughs> the word contrition, contritus in Latin, literally means to be broken up. <laughs> so, you know, when something bad happens to us and it's bad, you'll say, oh, she's all broken up over what happened two days ago. That's exactly what contrition means. It means I look at what my life has been, the choices I've made, and I am broken up because of the, I need to change. If I don't recognize that they were bad, I change nothing in my life. If I think eating, drinking super gulps every two hours of soda is just wonderful, and I disregard anything the physician has to say, or my high blood pressure, or anything else, and I just keep doing that, we die, right? This is what we do. So the same thing here, if we never come to the point of realizing the deficiency and the failures in our bad choices that we call sin, and remember in Saxon, the word sin means mistake. Sin. S-I-N, it, it means a mistake, it's an error. It's something that I did. The word error in Latin means I'm wandering. Error literally means I am wandering. That's why when you run errands, errands are the things that make you run around. The verb error means literally I am wandering. I'm wandering around. Okay? So my errands are the things that make me wander around the city and pick up this and pick up that. All right. So the second point, he says, then, an end, which brings about an end of sin and its condition. And the third point is this acknowledgement of this he talks about the repugnance toward the evil actions we have committed. Repugnance, that's a strong word. But it means I really dislike what I have been doing up until this point. I need to change this. They're not all, you know, I shot my neighbor or anything, but they can be quite profound and quite debilitating in our choices. So part of the virtue of penance is also this repulsion of what these mistakes or errors or sins are. And the last point to note in here then is the purpose of amendment. I have the desire to fix this. If I'm broken up over it, if I have a repugnance to these things that I've been, that I've been doing in my life, then I propose and I set myself to change and to change these things. That's the purpose, what we call the purpose of amendment. Okay. So that, in that little paragraph, I mean, you can go through it and read more of the details. I just want to touch some of these points on the virtue of penance, because the rest of it is on the sacrament of penance. And it's clear that the patriarch wants us to be using the mystery of penance. I mean, if everyone starts coming, I won't be able to say the rosary before Mass anymore. But 
let's say that that would be a nice swap. I've never sat in a confessional empty. I have come out of, in all the other parishes I've been in, I would come out, we'd have Mass at 8 and Mass at 10 usually on Sundays. And coming out after the 8 o'clock Mass, you're now done at 9.15, you come out, and the line for the 10 o'clock people is, they're already all standing. And they would be from that corner of the basement to about the, to where this um, machine is. And those are the people who are already lying before I even got my vestments off from the first Mass. So you just go in the confessional, boom, 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 door slide, door slide, door slide. And it was great. It was, you know, it was a lot of work, but... Clearly the Patriarch does not want us just dedicating the beginning part of Mass just to sing the Rosary. Okay? He wants the priest to be busy. So, but we can't be busy until we understand what the mysteries are, and we can't understand the mysteries until we're taught, and we can't understand even the, the whole conversion process of our soul. Right? And again, we are heavily influenced by Protestants. So just tell God in your heart and it's all good. That's never been the Catholic vision. Because you know, in the Eastern traditions, what it is is that in the Eastern traditions, every single one of you in a parish, every single person is meant to, the priest will stand in front of the iconostasis, the image of Christ, and every single person will come up and mention something to receive absolution. They're not quite as juridical as the Romans, where you have to mention every single thing in detail in numbers, though the bishop, the patriarch is going to mention that. But you have to mention things that are true sins about my life that I'm confessing to the image of Christ while the priest faces outward. Then I kneel down, the stove was on my head. He, he pronounces absolution, forgive me of all these sins, so that everyone in the parish is cleansed before receiving their Easter communion, the Pascha. Yes. Throughout our liturgy, though, we're asking for forgiveness of our yes. sins. I mean, our prayer. The patriarch's not going to say that that replaces the mystery. It doesn't sentence. replace it, okay. No. No, I, but I've asked somebody, and apparently that got into some people's heads from the 70s oh, yeah. afterwards. I, I thought that that was just good enough. Them. No, there are major conversions and absolutions in the liturgy, but you'll see that the patriarch doesn't even, he doesn't even refer to that. Yes? Uh, do the Maronites have the same... Um, um, requirement, so to say, speak uh, of it, making a good confession at least once a year, as well, the Latins do? The Latin, that's a, that's a code, that's a canon for the Latin church. Right. But yes, I mean, especially the Maronites, because they have, you're supposed to be, the idea is that, is that everyone's required annually to go to confession if they're conscious of mortal sin, if they're aware of doing something seriously wrong. But you have to remember, traditionally, missing Mass is something seriously wrong, okay? So all these people who show up once every five years and say, I'm good to go, I'm a good person, it's like, okay? And when you're not good to go and you show up and go to communion, that's considered a sacrilege because you're actually not disposed. That's another mortal sin, mm -hmm. you know? So to back you up, say you haven't done any mortal sins. I'm not saying we're perfect, right? but, you know, when I was a kid, I fought with my brother, I disobeyed so when, my parents. When there is, so when, when, there is no, when there is no grave sin, no serious sin, then no one's ever obliged to confess anything. I mean, you're encouraged to go because you're still receiving the grace of the mystery. Okay? But the idea is, in the, in the church's mind, is that on the day of the resurrection, every single baptized member of the body of Christ is alive and receiving the divine Eucharist. That's the idea of Easter communion, Easter duties, is the idea that at least once in the year we're going to all be alive in Christ. Now, that's the idea. And, and just showing up, not having been there for a year, and just going to communion is just another sacrilege. You're just committing another grave sin. So that's not the, it's not the point of just going to communion. It's meant to be in the state of grace and in good standing to be able to do this. Yes? What I used to teach my students is that... Um, when, when you're going to for the sacrament of reconciliation is that perhaps you don't have a mortal sin no. but uh, you know you don't have something that's deadly but if you have kind of like little comments. menial sins kind of they sin. still weaken you yes and even when, we, even when we're not even aware of something I did last Tuesday I could probably think of something from 20 years ago that I've already confessed but you can, you can mention it again no, it's a sign of a repentance. I, you know, I, 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 I confess this again. Anyways, we're getting ahead of the game here. But so the patriarch then goes on to talk about the rozo, the sacrament, the mystery, the rozo. 
And so the sacrament, he says, is based upon the personal confession of sins. You see, when we're at the Eucharist, at the divine liturgy, that's not a personal confession of sins. It's an absolution for the body of Christ. Forgive us our sins, show your mercy upon us, upon your people who employ you, who bow before you. Yes, but that's not the mystery of penance. That's why the patriarch points out here that it's built upon the personal confession of sins. In the 70s, the Latins were getting into the idea, well, let's do general absolutions. So everyone come in, and we'll sing hymns, and then we'll, we'll think about we've been bad. And then, or sometimes we'll have ceremonies, we'll write them down, and then we'll all do big processions up and we'll burn them in the front. And then we'll give you absolution for everybody. And it's like, well, cool, I don't have to go tell, you know, the minister of Christ about these things. You know, but the minister of Christ has to do the same thing himself. I mean, no one's, he's not absolving himself. Everyone has the same obligation. But Rome never authorized that. They were doing it all over the place. And eventually, I mean, they finally stopped. It's not that common anymore. General confessions, you know, general absolution was possible in cases. I mean, it's something that did exist. But like soldiers going off to battle. You have a whole battalion. You can't hear all their confessions. And the battle has started. So that's right. Okay, boys, that's it. I absolve you. Ego vos absolvo. Right? I absolve all of you. Or you're, you're on the plane. And it's a 737, and we're going nose down into the pavement. You've got 30 seconds, okay? I absolve you of all of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and centuries, and excommunications insofar as you are able, and I am capable. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. And then we all go through the open door. But of course, that also depends. I mean, I can do that as the plane's crashing. But it also depends upon the disposition of the people receiving, because all graces are the question of our reception. Okay, so the personal confessions of sins to the priest who has the divine power to give the repentance absolution for sins. Now, next page, page four. He says that the sacrament is the means. Notice he's telling us the rosa of penance is the way that we achieve repentance of heart by divine grace and cleanses all <coughs> sin. It's only in baptism as a mystery and in penance as a mystery that we have certitude, moral certitude of being forgiven. That's it. Those are the only two moments in Christian life that we know that we are definitely forgiven. Okay? Can you repeat that? Only in baptism, when we're baptized, and only in the sacrament of penance are the only two moments in which we have the moral certitude that all of our sins have been forgiven. Otherwise, we never have a moral certitude. Okay? So that in the confession, right, the, um, what confers the sacramental grace, and that's in his next paragraph, is that penance is a remedy to free us from our daily faults and to preserve us from mortal sins. I mean, when's the last time you heard mortal sins being referred to? <laughs> yeah. But the patriarch, he's clearly trying, he, he wants conversion. It's clear in this letter he wants conversion at the beginning. Right? Because, of course, in many ways he's watching the Maronite church in Lebanon die. They're immigrating. The faith is being lost. They haven't had children for 50 years. They all have 1.2 children or 2.1 or whatever it is. And the Muslims still have five or six like they always used to do. Because they started contracepting or whatever they were doing. I don't think there was a plague upon just the, Mar the Christians in Lebanon, but they decided <coughs> nicer house in the hills and only have one child. And now they're losing their position population-wise. Demographics change. So we need this kind of conversion going on. And so the sacramental grace which is conferred within the divine mystery, this is not in the letter, the sacramental grace is the specific grace given to us in the future to overcome what I have just confessed. So I'm a little bit too much of a gossip, you know. So I confess this. The sacrament gives me moral certitude. When I leave that absolution, I know all of that gossiping has been cleansed from my soul. Even if, it, even if it's not gossip that's mortally sinful. I, it's the only time when I know that has all been forgiven. And I also know by the divine mystery that the sacramental graces are there to strengthen me in the future to overcome 
precisely what I've just confessed, in this case, gossip. So I know that I also have not only the forgiveness of these sins with moral certitude by the mystery, I also know that the sacramental grace is there to help me to overcome what has just been you know, part of my failure. That is why the sacrament of the mystery of penance is the greatest method of our advancement in the Christian life. Not the liturgy. The liturgy is what we do in honoring God when we receive communion when we are properly disposed. Yes, then our Lord picks us up and takes us further into the divine light. But in our personal movement in these divine mysteries, the sacrament of penance, because of the sacramental grace, is what is moving. And that's why the patriarch says at the top of this page, to achieve the repentance of heart by divine grace <coughs> and cleanse all sins. The sacrament is the means of that, yes. Now, is, in this letter, is the patriarch encouraging his priests to preach this as well? Well, that's the letter, bit? yeah. I mean, that, the, the letter is addressed to the clergy. It's addressed to everybody. You know, so this, uh, this letter is addressed to the three and a half million Maronites all around the world. But the primary people are obviously the teachers and the agents of this, which are the bishops and the priests. So yes. So anyway, we will come back to this next week. But I want to show you the end of it. Well, you'll read through it. But you're, you're going to see. You know, like when I said, well, actually, the season of announcements is traditionally a time of penance. And everything. it's Christmas. Cheer up here. What's all these dark colors? And it's like, all right, look at the announcements for Christmas. He reminds us of the fast that we're supposed to be doing between the 16th of December and the 24th. That's since the 18th century. Before the 18th century, we were fasting from the beginning of announcements up until Christmas. Well, we'll get back to that in detail. But you're going to see in here all the listings of the different, and then, of course, what the Great Lent is, you know, the quantity of food that I put into the bulletin. But you have them ahead here now. You can read them. I'm sure it will be quite a source of phone calls and, and discussions and coffee and donuts. Because you, the chosen ones who have gotten out into the cold and come here in the evening, you're the vehicle of communicating all of this. I mean, a lot of them look at me like I've got four heads. And of course, we have dozens and dozens of our people who never even get near this building, except when someone dies. Who communicates, hey, they're your cousins. You talk to them. You tell them what the patriarch has brought up. I mean, this is not that Father James is a lunatic. <laughs> but it is a tradition that belongs to us and it's part of the beauty. We'll come back to this next week because there's a lot in this letter. But in reading it, you'll have an idea. And he'll, you'll also notice that at the end, he says, it is mandatory for us to fast the whole first week of Lent and the whole week of the Passion, minimum. So even just the Ash Monday and Good Friday thing that we have with the Latins, no, the Patriarch doesn't say anything about that. He says, the whole, if, if you cannot fast the whole time, then the whole first week of, of Lent and the whole week of the Passion, Monday through Saturday, fast. And then the middle ones figure out how you're going to do extra works of charity to make up for the fasting you're not doing. It, it's, this is excellent. This is really hopeful. It, it'll sound hard at first, and FIFA will all of a sudden become nostalgic because this is the way but it But I was. don't have to do anything. Yes. <laughs> But you're over 65, but right? So, so that's a Latin law. You'll also find out the patriarch never says anything else. He says for the elderly, if their health can't sustain it. But it's the Latins who say, okay, again, boom. From the age of 18, boom, to the age of 60. Patriarch doesn't give any limit on life. And that's on fasting. The abstinence of the kind of food we eat, he never gives any parameters. In other words, even if I'm eating, you know, because I have I have low blood sugar, so I have to eat every every hour and a half or something. Yeah, well, make it just all make it almonds and not pieces of cookies and or or, or milkshakes or any of the other dairy products or eggs or cheese or. So, anyways, you'll get all the parameters there. And that's why when this lady came back to me the following week, she's like, oh, "It's everywhere in Lebanon." I said, "Well, it's because of the letter last year." So this is it. We are becoming serious. Good. All right, we'll finish with our prayer. Sorry, right, everybody. Okay. That's right. After the war, 
Yeah. And the obsession with sports that begin after World War II. Yeah. That becomes the major. I mean, now Catholics all just go play soccer on Sunday morning instead of... Did she tell years. you how many people from this parish were in World War II? Oh. Seventeen. Well, you know, all, we, we have a whole yeah. monument of all the, all the boys who died in World War II. A beautiful monument of our lady, Paul River. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. O oh God, you are before all ages, and you exist from age to age. You are resplendent, glorified, and unsearchable light. Through your word, you bring forth light and give us each day. O radiant day and source of all light, we glorify you, adore you, and offer you praise night and day. Accept our praise and answer our prayer. Send us your abundant blessing through the mercy of your Messiah. To him, with you, and the Holy Spirit, be glory, honor, power, and thanksgiving, now and forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. It was in the beginning, is now, and shall be, or without end. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us who have recourse to you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a good evening. It's beautiful to see you. Thank you.